Okay, greetings from Eugene. I am going to talk about the energy that gets put onto a capacitor as a result of charge being placed on the capacitor. So how I want you to think about this is to think about the two plates of the capacitor that start out with nothing on either plate, so there's no energy stored. Well, let's imagine here that I take um, a charge on one side of one of the plates. Now, on, keep in mind on everywhere you have minuses and pluses on all these plates, but they're all paired. So every minus has a, a, a plus that it's paired to. It's hard to draw here. So everything's net neutral. But imagine then, I'm going to draw them without drawing all the dipoles there. Imagine that I just take one of the dipoles and I break it apart and I move the minus, let's say, to the other side. Now, I would do it by pushing it through the circuit, but you can equivalently, equivalently think that I just move it from one plate to the other. All right, so after I do that, I have a minus on one side and a plus on the other. So it would be a capacitor, if you like, with just one charge on it. Now, let's say then I do it again, so that I have another minus and plus here, and I take this minus, and I move it again to the other plate. The question I ask you is, um, what's happening as far as the work that is required to move a charge from one plate to the other. And the answer, if you think about it, is that it gets harder and harder to move this minus sign from this plate on the right here to this plate over here on the left. So I'm going to go to another slide. So if I were to redraw this again, for each charge that I move from here to here, it gets harder and harder to do that. So you could think that the incremental amount of work done in moving the charge from the right plate to the left increases as more charge is moved. The reason being that the more minuses I have over on this plate, the harder it is going to be to extract yet another minus charge and move it over to the left side. This minus charge here really wants to stay here, and it doesn't want to go over here. I liken this as pumping a tire full of air. It gets harder and harder to put in that extra pump as the tire gets fuller and fuller. So that's the closest analogy I can come up with for why it's hard, harder and harder to move a negative charge from the right side to the left. So let's think about um, the, the definition for work. Uh, work is equal to force times distance. And force for... Um, these charges is equal to Q, the size of the charge, times the electric field that that charge happens to be sitting in. And when that electric field is caused by a point charge, so one point charge, remember the electric field is given by, um, that's K times Q over R squared for point charge. And so um, if I want to find the force that's exerted, um, by this electric field here on this other point charge, which I'll call uh, Q1, then I would multiply this expression here by Q1, and I'd be back to Coulomb's law, which is what we started this topic with a while back. Let's say now that the electric field is a uniform electric field. Right now, a uniform electric field would be drawn by or expressed by having a bunch of parallel electric field lines like that such as what you get when you are between two plates of a capacitor, where one plate is, is charged positively and the other plate is charged negatively. So there you have your uniform electric field. Um, and the strength of the uniform electric field we talked about for uh, in between these two charged plates, one positively charged and one negatively charged, is that it is sigma over epsilon zero, where sigma is the charge density, And if you remember, the charge density is given by the size of the charge, Q, divided by A. So I could rewrite this expression as Q divided by A epsilon zero. Okay, so that's the strength of the electric field between these plates. So let's think about what happens when I add another little piece of charge, when I take another minus charge and move it over here again. And then if I do it again, if I do it again and again and again, what happens... Um, to uh, how does the electric field change? Well, how it changes is each time I do that, I'm basically adding 
a small little bit of charge which I'll call dq each time I do that. So what I'm actually going to do, if I want to find what the work is that's being done each time I move another charge, I could calculate it like this. I could say, okay, the work that I'm doing is equal to the integral of all these pieces of work I'm doing. And each piece of work is equal to force times distance. So I'd be integrating that. And as I pointed out, it's um, what I'm integrating it over are these little pieces of charge, dq. So how does that relate to dq? It would be integral of e times q times d dq. All I did was I broke up the force into e times q, which is what I showed you it's equal to earlier. Then I could put in my expression for the electric field. It's equal to charge q divided by a epsilon zero times d dq. So now I integrate, now let me pull out all the constants. I have 1 over a epsilon 0 times d, put the d on top there, integral q dq. So this becomes d over a epsilon 0 times q squared over 2. All right? Now, um, this here, this expression on the left, d over a epsilon zero, should look familiar to you. Um, if you remember the equation for a parallel, parallel plate capacitor, this here is one over the capacitance, because the capacitance is given by c is equal to a epsilon zero over d. So d over a epsilon zero is precisely one over the capacitance, one over c. So I can rewrite this entire expression right here. I'll do it on the ne next slide as the work that's done in moving a charge from one plate to another is equal to one half q squared over c where c is the is the charge on the capacitor and c of course is the capacitance and farads, and the charges in coulombs. All right, and, and I can also express this other ways. If I use this relationship here, that q is equal to cv, I could find I could rearrange this whole thing, and I could find out that the work is equal to um, instead of one half q q squared over c, it could be one half cv squared. That's another expression. That's a useful expression to think of in terms of how much work does it take or if, for that matter, how much energy is stored by a capacitor that has a voltage V across its plates. So either of these expressions may prove useful to you in finding the relationship between energy stored on a capacitor, the size of the capacitor, the charge on the capacitor, or the voltage or potential difference across the capacitor. Okay, that's all for now.